everybody! I am that nursing prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to talk about triage and emergency nursing. And now, this is important, of course, in real life, in clinical practice. You're going to need to know this stuff as a nurse, but it's also really helpful as a nursing student when answering some of those NCLEX style questions, especially ones where they're having you prioritize your care. So you need to decide what patient to see first, or what action should the nurse do first? So this is gonna be really helpful to answer those questions. So let's get into it. So the first thing we need to talk about are the three levels of triage. So emergent is life or limb threatening. So if you don't do anything, the patient will die or lose a limb. Urgent is not necessarily life or limb threatening, so it's not as serious, but Treatment is needed very soon because it could potentially become emergent, okay? So very important. And then finally, we have non-urgent, which is where it can wait, okay? So treatment can wait without becoming life-threatening. So we can have the patient in the emergency room waiting for a little bit, and they're not going to deteriorate. They're not going to become unstable that quickly. These are usually represented by color. So emergent is red. Urgent is orange, and non-urgent is actually normally yellow, but yellow doesn't show up on the board, so that's why I put it in pink. But just know that. It's normally red, orange, and yellow. So how are we going to do this? We're going to do something called the primary survey, which is just a little 60 second or less head-to-toe assessment you're going to do on your patient, checking for any obvious things that are life or limb threatening. And the best way to do this is to use the A, B, C, D, E principle. So let's talk about that principle in more detail. So the first two are A and B. A stands for airway. So airway is our highest priority. And the first thing you need to ask yourself, is the airway open, yes or no? If it's not, the second thing you need to think about is are there any things obstructing the airway? So things that could obstruct the airway include vomit or even teeth. Maybe the patient got their teeth knocked out and they're aspirating on it. Is the patient responsive? If they're not, if they're unresponsive but with no obvious evidence of trauma, the best thing to do would be to open their airway by using the head tilt chin lift, just like you do in CPR. This, though, is contraindicated if you suspect a cervical spine injury. And that's why it's airway slash cervical spine, because you need to assess that, too, before you would open their airway. If the patient is unresponsive with obvious evidence of trauma, you're not going to use the head tilt chin lift. You're going to use the jaw thrust maneuver to open their airway. So after you've assessed the airway, the second thing you're going to go do is breathing, okay? So assessing their breathing. This includes assessing their lung sounds, their respiratory effort, noting the rate and the depth. So are they trying to breathe and how often are they breathing? Is it shallow? Is it deep? Is there any obvious chest trauma like a broken rib or a stab wound? And then finally, you want to assess for any jugular venous distension. So this is A and B. These are the first two things you need to check when we're doing the A, B, C, D, E principle. Now let's move on to C. C and D stand for circulation and disability. So we've checked the airway. We've checked the breathing. Now we're ready to check circulation. So how do we do that? We assess the patient's heart rate, their blood pressure, their peripheral pulses, check their cap refill, if it's a situation where chest compressions are needed, CPR is needed, this is the time we do it. This is when we start chest compressions. We're going to assess for hemorrhage because it depends on what happened to the patient and if they've experienced a trauma. So if they're bleeding a lot, we want to make sure that it's not a hemorrhage. And then once we get the order, we'll insert an IV and start lactated ringers, normal saline, or blood. So that also is going to be factor dependent on what's going on with the patient. So that's C, that's circulation. D is for disability. And when you see this one, I really want you to think level of consciousness. That's how you're going to remember it best. 
So the four levels are A, V, P, U. A is for alert, so your patient is alert. They're opening their eyes, they're looking around, maybe they're talking to you. That would be ideal, right? V is responsive to voice. So they're asleep, they're out of it, but you say, Mr. Johnson, are you okay? And then they kind of, you know, arouse and they wake up and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so they can react to that. P is responsive only to pain. So saying their name and saying, Mr. Johnson, are you okay? And they don't react. Pain would be actually doing something like a sternal rub or something to cause them pain and then they wake up and react to that. And then U is for completely unresponsive. They're not reacting to anything. Another scale we can use is the Glasgow Coma Scale. Okay, so remember with this one, 15 is the highest your patient can get and three would be the lowest your patient can get. So using this scale to kind of see the patient's level of consciousness and determine their disability. Where are they at? And the last one we have is E, which is exposure. The last thing we're going to check for is E, exposure. So we've done airway, it's open. Breathing, they're breathing. They've got circulation. Their um, level of consciousness, they're alert. The last thing we're going to check, have they been exposed to anything? And this is a variety of different things. The first being like environmental exposure. So for example, assessing for signs of hypothermia. Okay, so that would be an environmental exposure. If present, what are we going to do? Remove any wet clothing, cover the patient with a blanket, and instill warm IV fluids. So try to get their temperature back up to a normal range. If they're exposed to other things um, that could potentially be needed by the police someday, okay, that's your responsibility to try to you know, save that stuff and keep it as potential evidence. Okay, so this could be anything from like bullets or bullet shells, drugs, or bloody clothes. So maybe someday this information is going to be needed by the authorities, so you need to keep this stuff. So maybe they've been exposed to other things. Maybe they've come into the emergency room because they've just got a bunch of, you know, bullet wounds, and then you go to assess them, you're doing your primary survey, you take off their clothes, and then, oh, look at that, they have drugs taped to their stomach, and you're like, okay, I need to put those somewhere so that the cops can find them. True story, that has happened. <laughs> so if anything like that occurs, if there's any sort of evidence or things that could be used in the future, um, you wanna save that stuff because you don't wanna get in trouble for losing it or misplacing it or anything like that. So exposure is a couple of different things, okay? So the environment and external factors. So that is how we do the primary survey when we do triage. I hope you found this video helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.